So hi, I'm Catherine Fulton. I'm going to be moderating this panel. And thank you all for uh, being willing to uh, come and take more in. And we're going to get this to a conversation as quickly as we can. I'm sure people are absorbing a lot of things. We are going to be, in some ways, talking about impact investing, uh, what the, a new research report calls impact investing 2.0, moving beyond the, the pioneers. Uh, and we're privileged to have three uh, very experienced investors who are both involved themselves in investing, but also working very hard to build the domain of impact investing, whether we call it a movement or a field or an industry or an asset class, whatever your favorite um, language is. Uh, I've been privileged to be at uh, all six of these uh, SOCAP conferences uh, so far here in San Francisco, uh, and it has been really thrilling the way in which this has all evolved and how we're really starting to build a body of practice that we can draw some conclusions from. Uh, I'm joined, uh, who are going to actually give you a little bit of their story and what they're uh, seeing, first by Jim Sorensen, and Jim is uh, from the Sorensen Impact Foundation, and some of you may know, has recently created the James Lee Sorensen Center for Global Impact Investing at the University of Utah. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. Um, Ron Cordes, uh, who is co-founder of the Cordes Foundation, and we'll talk some about that, I'm sure his work. So investing and at impact um, assets. And then Gene Case, who is the um, co-founder of the Case Foundation, but also here really as a private investor um, and uh, to talk about her experience. What we're going to do is hear from each of them for a few minutes uh, in terms of what they think is very important about the next stage of developing impact investing. Uh, and then we'll see what themes are emerging and have a conversation with uh, each of you. And so, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, really interesting to see um, how SOCAP has progressed. Um, and I, I'm kind of a early to SOCAP, but I've been involved uh, really in the impact space before uh, I really knew that the term was associated with uh, social good. Uh, my background uh, is really as an entrepreneur, and I think one of the, 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 the greatest successes that I had was really with an impact uh, company. And uh, I started looking for ways to give back, and what really resonated with me were uh, those uh, types of philanthropy that had the potential to become scalable, to become self-sustaining and reach a much broader depth of impact than you typically see, at least that I was seeing. And so I really became interested initially in uh, philanthropy that was uh, oriented towards uh, these type of endeavors. Uh, and uh, then as I moved and saw these endeavors become profitable, I realized that, and this was primarily in the microfinance uh, area, uh, that they made p for good potential investments. So I became an investor and um, had some good success there and realized that this was something that could be a tremendous, uh, you know, power for change uh, in the world. And I've since uh, really oriented a lot of my time and efforts uh, in creating the foundation uh, and most recently, in endowing the Center for Global Impact Investing. This is a center that's really focused on impact investing at the University of Utah. And I'll explain a little bit about the, uh, the purposes and reasons. But I think to set it up, that uh, anything that really is uh, going to make a, a, an impact for good and be lasting is going to take time. Um, so. Uh, it, it's, it, it's also going to require uh, an ecosystem approach and infrastructure that, um, that really enables uh, a broad base of uh, engagement. And with that in mind, as I've looked at uh, my experience in the impact space, 
and this ecosystem, there's uh, been, a, to, to me, a very obvious gap that, um, that really needs to be addressed. And it's the gap between the ideation, uh, the, the entrepreneur or, or the concept with really an innovative idea and ultimately to where that's taken and uh, a business model's been developed, it's been tested, it's been optimized, it's been um, launched, and it's, it's to a point where a commercial return investor will uh, look at it as a, as a business and it will attract the capital that's needed to take it to the next level. So this gap, and it's often referred to as the pioneering gap, is where I've chosen to focus my time and efforts. And I think it's uh, an area that is ideally suited for uh, philanthropy. And so I've looked at uh, what philanthropy is doing in this area and what are the, what are the bottlenecks, what are the barriers to engagement. I, I, I um, have my own foundation and so I have a very uh, personal view and experience from this. And with that came really the concept of developing um, the center at the University of Utah that would provide really, I think, a double bottom line type of uh, return for, for my donation in providing students with an experiential education in uh, the impact field, but also provide, I think, foundations like mine, high net worth investors, and very early stage uh, impact investors with services um, and, uh, and deal flow um, and support that would be difficult to get or to justify paying for. Uh, and to do it all in such a way that is uh, high quality and provides an education and potentially a career track for the students that are involved and come to the center. And by the way, if we found that uh, students are really attracted to this, uh, this opportunity. It's a, it is a, a generational shift that I think we're seeing in uh, the way people give of their time and their, their, their money and resources. So the center was launched last year, and through that, um, I've had six different uh, program-related investments that my foundation has made that have been sourced. The work has been done by the center students. Um, they've essentially provided investment memorandums. They've helped in the, uh, the structuring of the investments and helped uh, them to be qualified for program-related investments. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous, uh, I think, service that's given and an opportunity to help bridge this gap. I think one of the other areas that's really important to me uh, is really involved in, in policy that will help to engage more foundations. I think with foundations you need to educate, you need to engage them, and then you need to facilitate. The, uh, their involvement in this field. And I think that program-related investments are a, a, a great tool and opportunity for foundations to engage and, and participate in, in, in the funding gap. And uh, less than 1% of the philanthropy in, in uh, uh, the country today is oriented towards program-related investments. I'd like to see that change. Uh, and I think a, a big uh, step towards that is uh, really a more of a policy, you know, tax issue, and that is, uh, uh, you know, getting behind the Philanthropic F Facilitation Act, which is an act that uh, is uh, right now in the, in the early stages that would essentially provide foundations with the same kind of designation that they have and they receive when they give to charities or nonprofits in terms of 501c3 letters, it would provide that kind of designation for program-related investments of these social enterprises. That then removes, I think, a lot of the uncertainty and um, uh, concern that foundations rightly, rightfully have uh, when they make these uh, with these types of investments. So these are areas that uh, are really important uh, to me and, and I'm focused on right now. And I think ultimately there are many other pieces to this uh, ecosystem and infrastructure that need to be put together. But this is where I focus my time. Thank hey, you. Good, thank you.
think that's you, Ron. We were assured in the back that uh, this entire structure is rated for winds up to 70 miles an hour. <laughs> and as of today, they've been barely in the high 60s, so we, we should be good. So seven years ago this month, actually, a couple of partners and I had the opportunity to sell a business in the investment space that we'd built over 20 years. And my wife Marty and I did something that we'd always wanted to do. We created a family foundation. And if you'd have asked me at the time how I would have envisioned myself as an impact investor, I'd have first had to ask you, well, what is an impact investment? The field was so new, the term hadn't even been introduced. We became impact investors, I would say, originally somewhat out of frustration. And it was frustration that as we began to get all of the type of consulting advice one gets in setting up a family foundation, all of the advice was around how we could do good in our grants budget the five or six or seven percent per year we chose to allocate. And the idea with the other 95 was, you know, you're an investor, go invest it. But this is where you do good is in the grants budget. And we kept saying to these folks that we were bringing in for advice, we want to catalyze 100 percent of the assets that we'd set aside. How can we do that? And over time, we began to meet social entrepreneurs. We began to see business models that made sense. And we began to see investable opportunities so in late 2007, we challenged our board that over the next 12 months, we wanted to invest 20% of our capital, of our total endowment, in what we defined at the time as social enterprise investments, because a lot of the great work that's been done by Rockefeller and others hadn't been completed yet. So the term impact investing didn't exist. What also didn't exist in 2007 was any infrastructure to support the field. So we went out with a team of MBA interns looking for impact investments. And my business had been all about creating investment funds and working with fund managers. So I thought the corollary for our foundation would be that we would make some great seed investments in a number of impact investment funds. The problem was there was no organized way to find any of them. There were no databases that existed. And short of Google searches, there was, SOCAP didn't really exist yet. There was no way that these managers were starting to come together yet. And what I realized was that what the space was lacking was the type of infrastructure that every other asset class and category, venture capital, private equity, hedge funds, had developed to effectively connect investors with capital, with capital opportunities. We did, in fact, become fully invested with that 20%. And we were very proud of the fact that by September of 2008, we'd invested that entire 20% across an impact portfolio that included both debt and equity. Now, many of you may recall what happened in September of 2008. I had told my board in December of 2007 that because this was a new field, we may indeed lose a little money on these investments, but we wanted to lose it as field builders and we wanted to lose it intelligently. And as we got into late 2008, and we saw what was happening in the global financial markets, I was concerned about what that portfolio return may look like over our first year. Wouldn't you know, when we marked our portfolio to market at the end of 2008, not only did our impact investments not perform worse than our traditional investments, but that 20% actually outperformed the rest of our portfolio. And what I learned out of that was in a world where everything else had become incredibly interconnected, Many of the impact themes that we were investing in, global microfinance, SMEs in the developing world, weren't connected with the global financial crisis. And so what I began to see as an investor is we were making impact. We could see that. We could feel that. We were starting to measure that. And it also made sense as an investment. So stepping back, we made the decision to go from 20 percent to 30 to now ultimately 40, and we're on a path that we hope will take us to 100% investment for impact in our portfolio. And we're doing that somewhat as a demonstration project, if you will. We see our portfolio as an R&D lab to prove that this works. But we've also funded and helped to create, which Catherine had mentioned, an entity called Impact Assets. And Impact Assets was our attempt to try to build some infrastructure in the field that didn't exist in 2007 when we began investing. The research that we've done at Impact Assets and that we've sponsored by their organizations 
has basically demonstrated that the problem with growing this field isn't lack of demand from investors. It's not the lack of an adequate supply of investable deals and the capacity to put capital to work. It's the fact that the entire investment ecosystem is not yet built in the middle of it, much as Jim referred to in the work that he's doing. So Impact Assets is a nonprofit financial services company. We're designed specifically to be a field builder, but we're also designed to put capital to work. Today we have over 100 million of capital at work through a donor advised fund that we sponsor that makes it a very easy vehicle for individuals and even foundations who come to us wanting to begin investing for impact and using our balance sheet and our vehicle as a way to do it. We're also building out products for financial advisors. We have a relationship with now one of the largest financial advisor networks in the country. And the idea is working through financial advisors, working through family offices, wealth advisors, how do we build that infrastructure that connects the interested investor, the investor today that's interested in connecting their values, or as I call it, their passions with their portfolio, with the myriad of investment opportunities we're certainly seeing over this four or five days, the investment opportunities that exist in individual deals and in funds that absolutely, as we've proven in our small foundation portfolio, can make sense as investments. So we're on a mission at Impact Assets to democratize this industry. We're looking, we're hoping to come out with some products later this year that will bring the investment minimums down to 25,000 for a number of investment vehicles that today are at 250, 500, or a million, and allow a category of investors to begin investi investing directly that find it very difficult today. And at the same time, we're working with a lot of other family foundations around this concept. And tomorrow, I'm on a panel tomorrow afternoon about 100% for mission around this concept that as a family foundation, we should all be doing better than just granting 5% per year. We should all be looking at that corpus of assets that we have with the responsibility to use as much of that as possible to move forward the issue areas that are important to us. So I look forward to a, a further conversation and thank you for your time. Oh. Hi folks, I'm Jean Case. I'm CEO of the Case Foundation and I'm also a private investor. And I think my real role on the stage here today is the title, Moving Beyond the Pioneers. Because although my husband and I have been making impact invest investments for over a decade, we're fairly new to the impact investing sector. In fact, we'd been kind of doing our thing for a number of years not even knowing that pioneers had gone before us and lots of work with a pick and an ax to figure it all out and, and lay the groundwork had taken place. And I'm delighted to be on the stage with pioneers and thankful to folks like Omidia and the Rockefeller Foundation who play a central role at this conference but have served as real mentors to us as we've gotten more engaged. So our own role in impact investing really has evolved. And much like Ron just said, when we got started in it, we didn't call it impact investing. We just said we were making impact, investments with the intent to have impact. And I think what's really surprising to me as I come into the sector is to realize, you know what? We still have a lot of definitions. Impact investing can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. I bet if I stopped and said, what's your definition? What's your definition? What's yours? We might hear three different definitions around impact investing. And I think that's okay because our own experience is when you're trying to build a movement and you're trying to create a revolution, it's really messy in the beginning. And you kind of want that messiness so that you can figure out what's going to make sense in the long run. What things should we try that will actually get traction? And what things will we find out, well, that's not really what we want to do. But we do see a great need for, for definition as we go forward. And as I talk about our own impact investments, I'm talking about specific investments made with the intent to have impact that's measurable. And I'll give you an example of some of the things that we've done. We've invested in something called Sadara Ventures. My work as co-chair of the U.S.-Palestinian partnership brought together a number of different investors to create a fund, basically to fund the IT sector in the West Bank. It was an economic development play to condition the region for peace. 
It turns out there's ten th tens of thousands of uh, English-speaking, talented engineers in the West Bank who get a great education, develop their skills, and have nowhere to go. No jobs, no capital opportunity. So the fund was put together, fund was raised successfully, and is now, you know, some of the first investments are going out in the West Bank, and that was called Sadara Ventures. That, to me, is a pretty pure impact investment by almost anyone's definition of impact investment. We also did something called the Brain Trust Fund. And there, we had been involved in creating and funding a nonprofit called Accelerate Brain Cancer Cure for some time. And what we saw was a gap in the market. We were trying to bring new therapies forward. In brain cancer, there really hadn't been any new therapies. And there were a lot of small companies doing some really cool and interesting things. But because of the risk involved, they weren't getting the capital. So we put a fund together. We were extremely transparent about the risk involved. Many of the investors were also philanthropic investors in the case, and they jumped in and played a role as well. And so the Brain Trust Fund today funds innovative therapies for any form of brain disease. Another what we consider kind of pure play in terms of its impact definition. But then we get into some areas that maybe get a little bit squishy and start to challenge, is that impact or is that non-impact? And I'll give you an example. We've invested in, we, you know, Ron talked about democratizing impact investment. Absolutely, I think we all want to see that. Uh, we wanted to democratize philanthropy or help democ democratize philanthropy. So we put about $4 million of investment into three different giving platforms online. And together, those three platforms to date have represented over a billion dollars in micro donations. You know, and when we got started with that, it reminded me a lot of the kind of talk that we have at this conference and around impact investing. It's, well, how do you know people will give? What makes you think there's a bigger audience out there? You know, how, how are we sure anything meaningful is going to really be there? So that's been exciting for us. But in my mind, that would be sort of in this squishy territory. Do you call that impact investing? We can definitely measure the impact of what those companies and that investment has done. And in our investment company revolution that my husband funds, we funded Zipcar. So it turns out Zipcar, for every Zipcar, takes seven other cars off the road. Now, in our family, we don't have agreement on some of these impact investments. My husband wouldn't call Zip, Zipcar an impact investment. I would. I think it has real measurable social return that I feel good about. And so what we realized was, in our own family, we're kind of like the market of investors out there, and that we'll all bring a different risk tolerance, we'll all bring a different view on what's being measured, what has to be present in the company, what has to be present in terms of its social impact, et cetera, in order to make the screen or the cut. You know, but in general, we think there's room for all of this, and the challenge really is defining it, making it clear for investors so they can jump in, and beginning to measure and report what the experience is going to be. But it shouldn't surprise you that we're big believers in movements and revolutions. We had the really wonderful opportunity to take a company forward that when it got started, nobody saw the potential either. I started my career in technology in some startups that had a vision to democratize access to information, communication, ideas. What we know today really is the internet. So I landed at a startup called America Online that my husband and I had the opportunity to take forward. It was the first company to go, first internet company to go public. Um, after the merger, which, you know, the merger generally has not been seen as a positive thing, the return to AOL uh, shareholders on the stock price was 10,000%. Uh, so, you know, even though it, it sort of uh, dealt with some hiccups along the way, the AOL shareholders really, really um, were able to, to look at that as a positive value growing opportunity for them. But when we think about AOL, and if you talk to anybody, that's not how we judge its success. How we judge its success is when I'm standing here today and I see maybe you're tweeting, maybe you're texting, and maybe you're sending email, and I say that's great, because that was really the vision and the mission 
of the company. And you know, we didn't do it alone, but we definitely, definitely played a central pioneering role in taking forward what probably has been world-changing for all of us in terms of access to ideas, communication, and information. So the view really from someone new to this is there really is a lot to be figured out, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, but I think we're really undaunted by that. As we got started, you know, people were spending one hour a week online. And so, you know, people didn't even own computers in their homes. If they did, they didn't have modems. If they had modems or a uh, communications device, they didn't have the software to connect. If they had the software, the network might not have come to their home. So it would have been easy, looking back in those early days, to say, there's just no way this is going to be mainstream. You know, what are you guys smoking? But we believed, and I think what I'm feeling at SOCAP and what I love is this is a community of believers. We can democratize impact investing. Yes, we have a lot of work to do. Yes, we have a, ground, a lot of groundwork uh, to lay. But the way we look at it is most investors want to make more money. I think what separates the people in this room is they want money to make more, basically. They want money to do more, to basically be more productive, more beneficial, bring more of a return that they can feel not only in their pocketbook, but in their heart and their soul as well. So looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for having me today. So let's actually pick up on a couple of these things, and especially on Gene's challenge there, and envision a little bit about where this all could go next. Um, I sit on the board of the Global Impact and Investing Network, the gen that was that came out of the uh, was founded about the same time as SOCAP was was getting started, and we've been looking ahead and trying to figure out where things are going. There was a great preview this morning uh, of a new research study I want to make sure everybody pays attention to because I think it's going to be very important. It's coming from the from the case uh, uh, center at uh, Duke from uh, Impact Assets, the organization that Ron founded, and from PCV, uh, and it's on Impact Investing 2.0, and they gave us a preview this morning of four or five of the, um, the characteristics of successful impact funds. They've studied uh, 13 funds investing $3 billion in 80 countries, and they're actually beginning to be able to see how the messiness is clarifying and the things that are actually true of most successful impact investments. I think they're doing a session this afternoon on that. Um, so there's a, we really are kind of at the at the crest of, 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 of things of breaking open in new ways. And I just want to pick up on a few of these things. I'm going to start with you for a second. Play out a little bit in terms of what you guys are building at Impact. Uh, at, you, you basically have this, the, the two, two acorns here. One of them is the infrastructure that's actually going to create products that will be accessible to more people. And the other is getting more foundations to um, do, you know, use, use more of their assets. Um, how quickly you think that, I mean, five, three, five years, well, where could that be? Paint us a picture of where that could be. Um, challenge our imaginations in the way that Gene um, suggested. Sure, thank you. Well, Gene, I love your analogy. Um, it's funny, I was explaining to my 23-year-old daughter two weeks ago, I'm not exactly sure why, I was explaining my first portable computer was a compact. I don't know how many of you, which was very an inappropriately named computer because it was the size of a suitcase <laughs> too large to put in an overhead compartment, and you'd lug this thing home. The only thing it plugged into was the 110 outlet in the wall. The about 1980 was about or 82 or something in there. Yeah. Well, so, so I think we are still very much in the early days of this impact investing space, but I feel strongly, and it's just maybe it's a gut feeling, but I feel strongly that. The movement is happening, and we are continuing to move forward, and we're going to see the same type of evolution in this space that we've seen in the technology space. A lot of it because the Gen Y millennials are driving it. They, they don't see why it's not possible to connect your money with your meaning, your portfolio with your passions, and as they begin to have money to invest, they're all looking to do it that way. So at Impact Assets, what we're trying to do is help to build 
some of that infrastructure, help to make it easier for people to make the connections. And I would say that the market we've tried to go after are financial advisors. The early research that we did indicated that uh, one study, Money for Good, done in 2009, a great study, it's available online on our website or the GINs, showed that I think it was 48% of the respondents, individual investors, were interested, in, very interested in impact investing. 40% were somewhat interested, only 12%, not so much at all. But yet less than 1% were doing anything. And the reason for that wasn't lack of interest and wasn't lack of potential products or investment opportunities available. It was because they just had never been connected. No one had explained it to them. They didn't know where to go to get it. And if you really drill down, the financial advice industry, the intermediaries, the gatekeepers, have been largely responsible for keeping the gates closed. So we spent a lot of time at Impact Assets working with those financial intermediaries to really share with them the opportunity that's there and from an enlightened self-interest perspective that this is a business opportunity. In much the same way as firms, companies that embrace the internet and that technology early built wonderful business opportunities for themselves, we're working with financial advisor firms, including some very large networks, and saying early adopters here will find resonance in this space and we're finding that there's interest. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, if this was a baseball game, what inning would we be in today? And I'm not sure that, you know, I think we're probably still at batting practice, right? But, <laughs> but, the, but the game has been scheduled. It's going to start. The stands are filling up. We're moving forward. And I think things never tend to happen as quickly as we would like. So it's always great to kind of think back on the perspective of things like the evolution of the Internet to realize that that's taking us a 20-year journey to get us where we've gotten. And we're early in that journey with impact investing. But I don't see any direction but, but forward yeah. for this. The truth is we're still early in the technology direction, too, I think, in its own yeah, way. That's right. um, well, in the, the 2018 SOCAP conference, we'll all be here as holograms. So, you know. <laughs> the, um, but, but so there are going to be a number of things that unlock this potential, right? So one of them is going to be incre decreasing, you know, getting that connection made better. Um, and and it's I'm really intrigued with this philanthropic facilitation act. I mean that these the small I mean we all know that the community development finance sector was unlocked by you know changes in the regulatory and tax structure. Um, this is this is, could be really big. Can you just tell us a little more about that and where that is and if people want to help, what they can do? Sure. Let me let me add a little context to it because you know. It, it, there are so many acronyms and different uh, types of investments that sometimes you have to navigate your way around to really understand where everything fits. And it really is an ecosystem. It really is uh, something that takes time to develop. I think what, what Ron is doing is something that would be very valuable to my foundation because I'm looking at ways to invest my corpus in mission-related investments, different from program-related investments, mission-related investments that drive impact. And so to have... Can you, just because there may be people here who don't understand that, can you make, make, make the difference clear for people? So um, there are certain requirements as a foundation that you need to make in managing your corpus. And, and, it, and the basic concept that guides it is something that's prudent, an investment that is prudent to essentially meet the purposes of the, of the foundation. And in most foundations, you're looking for a prudent investment that's going to generate a return. Uh, and when you look at that, you're looking at typical measures that uh, a typical investor would look at, like, you know, what's the risk? What's the track record? What's, uh, you know, where, what, what uh, asset allocation does this fit in? Uh, and that's the world that foundation managers, particularly the investment side of those uh, foundations, live in. And uh, if you are not careful in what you select, it can become a jeopardizing investment. In other words, the IRS can look at that and say, that was a foolish investment. You should never have made that investment. It could potentially jeopardize your foundation. And the corrective action is that you have to sell that within a relatively short period of time. And oh, by the way, since we didn't discover that until after five years that it was made, there's a penalty of 10% that ratchets up by 10% every year that we assess upon the directors and the uh, officers of the foundation or those that made that decision. So it's a fairly draconian 
event. And this, this is the, the context the foundations have in making the decision that you've, I think, made, um, and it was a very courageous decision, that we're going to move the corpus in a very methodical way from what would be probably zero in most foundations to 20. I mean, people don't understand. That's hard to do when you, when you have the context of these IRS regulations that you have to comply with. And so you're, you're paving the way to provide for my foundation's alternatives, that is, mission-related alternatives, prudent investment decisions that uh, are aligned with my mission. You and TriLink Global, and there are a few other, other funds that have seen this and now that are doing this, and it's, it's one thing to have something that you find, but another thing to have a fund that you get on the, the platforms of the investment banks and in the hands of the wealth managers and get them educated mm -hmm. to where um, they're now presenting these uh, alternatives to clients. And there's demand, I think, from clients out there. They just need to have uh, the, the product to invest in. So I really look forward to following that. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the 5% of the foundation money that's given away each year. And that can be made in the form of what's called program-related investments, or PRIs. These uh, essentially count towards the 5% that needs to be given away every year. And this is, is, I think, philanthropy that can be very catalyzing to very early stage. These are not the types of investments that would be a mission-related investment because they're too high risk. They're essentially, you're dealing with, uh, you know, first money in, you're dealing with situations where you, you're not primarily in it for financial return. I mean, that's one of the requirements of a program-related investment. You're in it for the mission uh, and the impact. Uh, and uh, that's the area that the uh, Philanthropic Philoso Facilitation Act uh, it addresses to make it much easier for these enterprises to have kind of a safe harbor, so to speak, that they can take to foundations like mine that are interested in making program-related investments, these very early stage catalytic investments to new entrepreneurs, new enterprises, that ultimately, if they, as they grow up and you look at the overall spectrum, they become candidates for um, the type of investments that, that are mission-related and, and typical return-oriented investments. Uh, where that act is, uh, it's in the early stages. We have uh, two centers uh, or two legislators in Colorado that are championing it on the House side. I'm working with uh, my... In, in Congress. In Congress. Yeah. I'm working with my, um, my own state senator, Orrin Hatch, uh, who's the ranking mentor, m m member of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, to kind of build the coalition. We have uh, a, a lobbyist engaged, and we're really looking to, I mean, what's going to take uh, to, to get this through is people educated, aware, their uh, support from constituents as well as on the House and on the Senate side, uh, a, a pretty good level of education and, um, uh, you know, I think enough support to where you overcome the inertia that you have on any new yeah. uh, legislative So if action. we think about the things that are going to drive us forward, we've got some of the infrastructure things, some of the regulatory things. Gene, what are you seeing as you all have gotten into the practice? What, what do you think would really unlock this um, from your perspective? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I was very honest about the fact that we had been doing impact investing and didn't know there was really a sector. And I think in my own experience, as we walk around and spend time with other investors, it's amazing to me who's not aware of impact investing at any of its definitions. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday, if you were in the room, two really good examples in my mind. We did a learning series with the Giving Pledge, and the Giving Pledge, of course, represents people who have agreed to give half of their wealth away. Um, and we thought that was a really terrific opportunity to talk to very sophisticated investors about impact investing. <coughs> and I think our jaws were on the table when, you know, names you guys know and many of us follow in terms of their investing patterns said, what is this? I've never heard of this. 
this is so awesome. This is, you know, how can we get engaged? And it was an eye-opening experience to realize that while many of us feel great about the momentum, we are in super early days. There are still so many significant influencers and investors that people follow who are just now learning that this exists. Similarly, up at the New York Stock Exchange did a fireside chat with their CEO and he asked you know, about some of the things we're engaged in. I talked about impact investing and he said, what's impact investing? I've never heard of it. The CEO of the New York Stock Exchange. So I do think we have some work to do, but this, this sort of ecosystem structure thing I think is important. I think definition is important, and, and it's, I don't think it's going to be one. You know, the analogy we use, and we like to look at movements that have crossed the chasm, right? Started out small and now is sort of in the ether. Um, and if you think about sustainability and you think about LEED certification, it really started to see some scale when people could understand it. You understood, okay, I'm gonna do this building, this, I'm gonna put this in, oh, that's platinum, oh, that's gold, oh, that's bronze. And I'm not suggesting we go platinum, gold, silver, bronze here, but that kind of organization might work here and might be a simple framework to help investors understand what it is they're looking at and where in that risk profile yeah. they might wanna play. The second piece that I think there's an urgent need, and our foundation has been working together with other foundations to look at whether we can't do uh, a measurement uh, project. So that, you know, today, if you ask, well, what's been the experience of investors and in impact investing, there's really not a lot of data. And we believe data helps drive decision making for investors. And I think there's a lot of things that aren't existing here that investors rely on in other places as they make decisions. But I, I'm not sure we can really get to that next level until we have a body of data that begins to let investors know what the experiences yeah. have been. You know, the, the definitional thing is so hard um, in, in, two, in two ways, I think. The, um, you know, give me the definition of a social entrepreneur. Right. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of things that it's language we use all the time that if we spend a lot of time worried about agreeing on a definition. Right. So in that sense, I, you know, that's correct. On the other hand, um, I think we, we are at a particular moment where the hype around impact investing has been such and the language is so taken off as it as it takes off in the next stage, everybody's gonna say, "Oh, I'm an impact investor," right? Right, and then you get the kind of greenwashing phenomenon of anybody can call them, you know. So, so we, there is the need for some rigor, uh, and I think there are are um, the research study that I mentioned and some work that the Gen is doing right. and other people. And it's not like you're gonna try to get everybody to agree. I mean, I get that, and there's always gonna be some some cleavages um, in 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 things. It's a it's a but it's a tricky. I am I am. I really am worried about the dilution that it becomes meaningless over time as well, right? I mean, I, you know, that it's, I mean, there's, there's, there is that danger. Right, everything to everybody, which we yeah, want to avoid. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, is there, I want to open it up to, to folks here, but I, I, I love sort of painting this picture of what it's going to, it's early days, but what is it going to take to unlock and what are the, what are the shoals that we have to walk through and things we have to avoid as, weather, as, as well as the things that we want to, that we want to unleash. Is there anything else any of you guys want to put on the table as something you really want to see happen um, before we, before we open it up to unleash things? You know, I would just add that in our, in our other movements that we've been a part of, the power of the ask is a really big deal. And this ranges from everything from investment to volunteering. So if you ask someone, the number one reason they volunteered, because someone asked them. And I think, you know, if you're sitting, we talked a little bit about this from the stage yesterday, if you're sitting in this audience this morning, chances are you're a true believer. So who have you brought? Who have you brought into the tent? And I think, you know, together, working with partners, I think we do need to build a clear language set and find a way for all of us to make the ask and for people to understand what is the ask we're making. Um, and it sounds simple, but it's actually pretty profound. And um, because this is SOCAP and because this is the core, the nucleus, and the pioneers, chances are you already have. But I know we, even in our own work, feel like we have some more to figure out before we sit with other investors 
investors and say, jump in, this is what we're asking you to do. And some of that work is finding comfortable on-ramps and doing some work in almost a getting started guide, if you will, some way to basically hold their hand and say, here's what it's all about, and here's some opportunities for you to play. And I think until we have some of those things developed, we're not gonna really see it. Yeah, well, these guys are trying to, and you're gonna train the next generation of uh, people. Exactly. Here too. How about anything else you guys wanna put on the table? Well, so uh, on the definition of impact, one of the things we did at Impact Assets in 2010 was we launched the first publicly available database of the leading impact investment managers. We had 400 submissions. We launched it at the Clinton Global Initiative. And the idea was to aggregate together for the first time the 50 leaders ranked by assets that they managed. And the biggest issue that we had wasn't figuring out the assets, that's all math, but figuring out what was really an impact investing firm. And Jed Emerson, who's part of our team at Impact Assets, actually led a group that developed a concept that he wrote up in an issue brief that's on our website called Firm Impact Capacity. And the idea was we had 400 firms submit to be part of this first database. We had one firm, I remember, that when, they, when asked, what do you believe qualifies you as an impact investment firm? They said, well, if we're selected, we would agree to sign the UN PRI. If selected and only if. So, in developing a firm impact capacity, we focused on a couple of things. One was intentionality, that if you're going to be an impact investor, you, it can't happen accidentally. So the idea was to have an articulated thesis of change that says, this is the type of change that we're attempting to implement with the investments that we're making. Second is to have a measurement process to measure that change. And then third is to publish the results. And some of those measurement processes now are the IRIS and the GEARS measurements through GIN, which are terrific. In other sectors, firms are more comfortable today measuring on their own. And we're okay with that as long as they have a thesis of change, they're measuring themselves to it, and they're publishing the results. And I would say that winnowed the list down significantly, but we still came up with a list much larger than 50 of firms that we really believe were walking the walk and creating true opportunities for investors to invest you know, for that wouldn't be a bad idea for philanthropy either. I'd say the thesis of change, you measure it, and you publish the results. That, that would actually be kind of revolutionary in philanthropy as well, wouldn't it? It would be. Um, we, so, won't, we won't go there, though, because we've only got another 13 minutes. Um, so. so did you have something you want to add, Jim? Before well, you... I, I was just going to say I think that's really uh, a lot of the uh, – the, the idea and uh, the core of the work that the center uh, does, that is, I think, number one, finding... This is your center, the center at the University of Utah. Uh, that, mm -hmm. ...that engages mm -hmm. students. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're provided, uh, you know, travel stipends, scholarships, and, and uh, internships, uh, and, and really work around the world in finding... Uh, you know, these types of opportunities for impact than in some of the very early stage work in helping the entrepreneurs and uh, the business models, uh, you know, ultimately the due diligence that may be needed by organizations like mine, market, it could be market sizing, it could be uh, any, any host of, of things that ultimately is needed, uh, as well as really quantifying and developing the systems for measurement of the impact uh, measures that uh, uh, are important to foundations. Um, and, you know, it's this type of very early stage work that, frankly, is beyond many foundations and their, their capabilities, and um, it's, a, it's a real barrier. And so yeah. we're hoping that this not only provides them with very useful information, very useful um, you know, services to, so that they can engage and become educated, but also, you know, the education for students is uh, just terrific. And yeah. for them, it provides, I think, uh, a potential career path that, uh, you know, next gen is going to be really what moves this forward. Yeah, you know, I, I work with a lot of large foundations, and they have lots of capacity that small and family foundations don't have. On the other hand, they don't necessarily have the expertise to do this either, and how you make it easier to do is, is key. So let's hear some um, uh, questions or comments. We've got a mic, and because of the way this is being um, simulcast, we do need to get uh, your question into the mic right here. Yep. See several hands. And identify yourself, if you would. Mike needs to be on. Hi there. 
My name is Rich. I work at Echoing Green, and we try to find ways to support very early stage social entrepreneurs. And so I wonder what advice anyone on the panel would have for early stage social entrepreneurs whose agenda is not necessarily about field building, per se, but who are thinking about pregnant women with anemia in India or high school kids in the United States. They don't necessarily care so much about where financing is coming from, whether it's philanthropic, whether it's investment, and they're trying to make decisions about which avenues to pursue and how much to, to really be thoughtful about this brave new world of impact investing. So the question really is not just general advice to somebody, but it's like in terms of which kind of, how to think about which type of investment? Na yeah, navigating this new world mm -hmm. that says there's many different sources of financing right. when you're an early stage social entrepreneur. Yeah. How much time, how much effort should they sort of be putting into uh -huh. figuring this world out when they have lots of right. other stuff to do so as well? So I just want to note that question would not have been asked 10 years ago or even five years ago because there, it wouldn't have been possible to think about the range of possible investments. It's a really, I mean, in some parts of the world, it'd be very small places, but just the fact that that question is a real question is an indicator of some progress. Does anybody have a, a, an answer, Jim? Well, I think it really depends on the stage. You know, if it's to a stage where you can engage a, a return-oriented investor, uh, you know, then, you know, that's, a, that's probably a, pr a pretty good place to go. But quite often, it's not to that stage. It could be, you know, the idea or, or a very early prototype. And that's where I think uh, philanthropy really plays a key role. Um, and that's the, the, really the pioneering gap that I'm talking about, you know, getting from that stage to where ultimately you can engage commercial investors, you can get this uh, down a trip, typical track that successful companies go to where ultimately, you know, they become mission-related investments. They're, they're uh, you know, targets for, for large investors and, uh, you know, the corpus of foundations like mine. You, know, you, want, you want to just answer? I'll just. So we a huge fan of Echoing Green. We share a lot of fellows with the Echoing Green organization, and it's a. There's. We've had a number of these young fellows, Echoing Green and our own, who have kind of said, "Well, gosh, now, maybe I'll convert from a nonprofit to a for-profit, so I don't have to worry about spending all my time raising money, and I can go out and get some impact investors." And what we've tried to, to kind of caution these folks is you need to have what I would call kind of an organizational self-awareness and hopefully a board of advisors that can help you figure out whether or not the initiative, the organization, the business model you have actually justifies an impact investment. It may well be a very attractive and viable philanthropic model, and it may not be possible to turn it into something that will bring in impact investment dollars. The one thing I will say, and it'll probably happen sometime again, it happens every time at SOCAP, is I will get a pitch from somebody who has a great enterprise who says, and we're looking for impact investments, but you know, we're doing such great work that even if you lose money, it's still going to be okay because it's going to go to this great work. And what I have to do is stop them and say, you know, I need to figure out in my own portfolio, am I making an investment? or am I making a philanthropic grant? And we do both, but the worst thing we could possibly do is mix up the two, because if I make too many philanthropic Absolutely. grants out of the other 95% of our investment portfolio, it does not, you know, the, the, the long-term success of our foundation and our viability is really gonna be threatened. So I do think that more work needs to be done by social entrepreneurs to really understand where their business model fits in the ecosystem. And a lot of the work that Jim's talking about, PRIs that might lead to MRIs, and some patient capital that leads to real commercial capital is often a direction that yeah. we need to Let's go. Let's get another question. I, I saw a couple hands over here. and You know what? Let's do this because of the time. I want to hear several questions rather than and, and so we can get more voices. So let's hear Jan's question right here, and then we'll take the mic over here. We got a second mic and back here. I want to hear, I want to hear a bunch of questions. Yeah. Thank you. And this is a follow-on to the echoing green question. Uh -huh. I wonder if you would address a question that that flags, which is what about the need for intermediation in this space? In other in other words, if I'm that entrepreneur and I am focused and need to be focused on my venture, but I also need to know what are the appropriate types of capital to tap for mission-aligned growth and scaling, what about the need in this spectrum for those of us who will be the intermediaries that will make uh -huh. some of those okay. connections? Because you haven't talked a little okay. bit about that part of the infrastructure. Okay, good. Back here. And then if you could take the mic back over here. Yep. 
Hi, uh, David Bank with Impact Space, which we launched today to try to address some of this question about uh, data and performance in the space. And we're, we're, we're trying to be an open uh, commons, data commons for impact investing. And we have identified what we're calling the sort of tragedy of the impact commons, which is everybody wants everybody else's data to be transparent, but not necessarily their own. And I'm so <laughs> kind of interested what you think about the, the need for investors to make uh, public, more public, their own investment activity, f f successes and failures, as a way to signal to other so investors. So the, the creation of the data that Gene referred to, how do we make more of it open and transparent? Um, back here? Yes. Yeah, I'm Jackie Vanderbreg with U.S. Trust, Bank of America. Um, and I want to pick up on Gene's comment about the number of people who don't know about this space, because someone said to me today, I'm so thrilled to be here at SOCAP. The choir has arrived. <laughs> And so this question of how do we get beyond the choir, and specifically I'd love the panel to, in, uh, to take the question of segments because our research shows that 72% of next gen investors, high net worth investors, say they will take more risk for right. impact. Right. Interestingly, um, women are over a third more willing to do that than men. So how are we They're as smarter we are, investors in general, but that's a how are we thinking about bringing this beyond the choir and in that what kind of segments are we talking okay, about? Okay, one one more right behind you. Yep. Uh, James Bowie, Lotus Impact, um, Impact Investing Fund based in Southeast Asia. Question is a variant of the intermediation um, idea. What are the top three roadblocks to uh, creating intermediation and what are the best three solutions moving forward? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Top three uh, roadblocks to kind of um, spur intermediation, and then top three solutions moving forward. Okay. So um, we got a question, some questions about intermediation, some questions about data transparency, and some questions about how we get beyond the choir. Um, anybody want to take, got, got energy to take up one of them? Jean? I'll start with get beyond the choir a little bit more. Um, so I completely agree that the millennials represent a beautiful picture forward. And in fact, if most of us failed at our effort to take forward impact investing, they will find a way to make the movement happen. So I mean, we can do a lot, hopefully, to accelerate it. But this new generation sees a blended world. They didn't grow up the way I did. They didn't see it in silos. They didn't say, OK, I have to be in government. I have to be in business. I have to be in nonprofit. They just see problems, and they want them to be fixed, and they want to bring everything they have. They're looking at that when they decide what company to go to work for, what products to buy. It is totally in their DNA, and we should all feel really, really jazzed by that. I I will say generationally, I think it's interesting, the three foundations represented on this panel today, and Kathy, I'll exempt you for a moment as moderator, are what we call living donors. And if you look at the market today, living donors have much more tolerance for risk, therefore are much more willing to open their minds to impact investing than those foundations where you're basically shepherding someone else's money who's not here anymore. And think about it, if tomorrow a friend said to you, will you watch after what I've left behind and do right, you're going to go immediately into con conservative mode and into risk averse mode because now you're taking care of someone else's money. So I think as we look at philanthropy, we may find philanthropy bifurcates a little bit. And I do think we've seen some early leadership, Rockefeller being one great example, uh, Omidia, of course, is a living donor, um, where you know some of the big old foundations have jumped in in a meaningful way. But generally speaking, I think the further you get away from the entrepreneur that made the money and took the risk and understood what it took, I think the, the harder it gets to embody ri or embrace risk. Um, but I think to grow the choir, there's a big old market opportunity. High net worth individuals, living donors, crowdfunding will play a huge role here. I think millennials will jump into the crowdfunding in a big way. I hope it works. Um, and you know, I just think we see some things on the horizon that are going to happen independent of what goes out from this room. Great. Um, in a way, this is going to be actually just a closing comment. Um, so, Ron, because of where we, that's a, that's a good challenge to us, Gene. Ron, sure. Well, maybe I'll address, there was a couple of questions about intermediaries. And I, I think that, again, it's all about building this ecosystem. But today, if I'm a social entrepreneur and I'm looking for investment capital, I've got to find ways to do it beyond just trying to find one investor at a time individually and find them, connect with them, make that pitch, and then figure out if they're even interested in the sector that I'm in. So the two things that I see, one is kind of the investment banking placement agent function, 
which I see a lot of firms doing effectively, where they can help connect either a fund or an individual enterprise with investors that they know are interested in what that fund or enterprise is doing. And the second is the organizations like Tonic, the angel investor group, that are bringing together and aggregating due diligence so that an, either a fund or an individual enterprise with a promising opportunity can get together with 15, 20, 25 investors, have them do their due diligence together, and not replicate that process over and over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Tonic's a good example. Village Capital is yeah. another. They yeah. work with in-country uh, intermediaries, uh, essentially incubators. And quite often, what entrepreneurs need is they need to understand what their, their true business is and what the principles are to make it successful and determine whether or not it, it can be a for-profit model and optimize that before they can start going to, you know, investors. And that's where some of that very early stage works, work is. And, and a lot of the, the efforts of the center that, uh, that uh, I've established there is also involved in, in that space. Again, very early stage. Yeah. Uh, well, you can, you can get a feel for how I think this is going to continue to pick up. And one of the things that I'm very excited about is actually looking ahead. There, one of my uh, new colleagues at Deloitte, um, uh, Bill Eggers, is just publishing a book called The Solution Revolution, which is out on the table outside. And I think they do a wonderful job of picturing this space that's actually been opened up, that SOCAP is in some ways the meeting of the tribe of, between the government and business and the nonprofit sector. I think we're living into that space in the next 10 to 20 years. It'll be a very, very exciting time. And impact investing is one of the engines of it, but not the only one. And uh, the fact that we haven't answered all the questions is uh, par for the course of where we are and, and lots of the rest of the conference. Thank you all for coming and thank our panelists.